do you think that we are getting away from capitalism as a society? Uh, the U.S. society? Or... The U.S. society and, and just the bigger society of the world. I mean, you're talking about how like we're trying to get away from the capitalist mindset. Do you think that is happening? I think that the current moment is characterized by an inability to resolve capitalist crises combined with a very clear emergence of what many people call a multipolar world. And the multipolar world, meaning a world in which there is not a unipolar dominance by a U.S. capitalism or U.S. style capitalism, is a world that is characterized, amongst other things, by very clear leadership on the part of China. Uh, China is a socialist country. And in that regard, many people see, and I think that this is a correct analysis, the multipolar world is a way of breaking up U.S. driven imperialism in order to create more space for the flourishing and further development of socialism. So in the broad kind of world historical perspective, I do see advances being made on the front of a uh, imperialism not being able to maintain the forms of hegemony that it had in the past or partial hegemony because it was never complete and an increasing development of uh, socialism or socialistically oriented forms of governance around the world. In the case of the U.S., it's a little bit more complicated given that it's the leading empire uh, and that it has arguably one of the most reactionary political cultures around the world, I do think that there is a very strong presence of an interest in socialism, particularly amongst young people. And this has been statistically proven, right? If you look at various polls about whether or not people identify as socialist or even communist, they've been going up. And so I do think that within the U.S. context, there's a lot of interest on the part of the youth and also just other disenfranchised populations with opening up the spectrum of analysis beyond the kind of boomer ideology and engaging seriously with socialism and a lot more socialist activism going on, uh, which I take it to be a net positive. And part of the project of the multipolar world is to develop a world in which the imperial hegemon in the United States is not dictating the nature of governance around the world. So as I mentioned last time, I am highly critical of certain of the governments that are part of the emergent multipolar world. It could be Russia, Iran, etc. Do I want Iran under the Shah and under a puppet CIA government in which there are basically, you know, the equivalent of the Gestapo uh, being run and overseen by the Central Intelligence Agency? Do I think that would be free and democratic? No, not at all. And so if we look at fascism in its kind of a imperialist manifestations, the development and emergence of a multipolar world, I think, is a rich way of struggling against imperialism. But if we want to go all the way to the end, we can't remain at the level of a multipolar world. The multipolar world has to be a stepping stone for a socialist world. If we understand fascism as the mobilization of usually state and parastate violence that's backed by the capitalist ruling class and allowed to act by the bourgeois state, that these forms of violence do tend to intensify in moments of crisis. And those crises can be because there's an external threat, like the threat of a socialist alternative, but it can also be internal threat, socialism internally, or capitalism's own inability to solve the contradictions that it produces in the first place. And that if you look in the contemporary international context, there are many, many political economists who have pointed out that neoliberalism is running out of speed, uh, out of steam. Uh, the rolling back of the social welfare state only goes so far, and then there's nothing more to roll back, and you just really start destroying people's lives at a more rapid pace. And depending on where people are situated in relationship to the kind of contemporary struggle between imperialism and the socialist alternative, I am of the camp that identifies socialism with Chinese characteristics as a reality, not as something that the Chinese aren't doing. And so I do see the Chinese experiment, if you will, because all of these are ongoing experiments, 
as attempting to do a certain form of socialism that differs from Soviet socialism, it differs from Vietnam, it differs from Cuba, et cetera, for very specific historical reasons. And that the rising prominence of China and its growth rates, which have been truly, truly incredible uh, over basically since 1949, but if you take out a few years of the kind of cultural revolution, it's almost been at 10% per year. And they're only now starting to slow that down in the name of developing a more environmental civilization, which there are global leaders in, then the contemporary crisis is not only that neoliberalism is running out of steam, it's that there's a country, regardless of where you're positioned on this, it's a country that calls itself socialist, at the preliminary stage of socialist, that is uh, now surpasses the United States in purchasing power parity. If you look at it in those terms, it's the strongest economy in the world. And it is uniting with countries around the world in an alternative development project. If, it, if it's BRICS, if it's the Belt and Road, if it's, you know, there's a whole series of different networked modes of development that Again, we wouldn't want to describe them as socialist developmental projects, but I do think it's coherent to say that they're not the imperialist model of development that's been shoved down people's throats through imperialism. And so in that specific context of a very powerful socialist country and an alternative model of international development that isn't the imperialist model of the West, regardless of how you end up defining and describing it, means that the crisis is that much more intensified. And I think it's precisely for that reason uh, that those two reasons of capitalist crisis internally and an alternative externally that we have seen more fascism rising within the capitalist countries and we're going to see a lot more of that in the coming future. It's one of the reasons that we not only have to understand it, but we also have to study and develop very important tactics for fighting against it and be clear eyed about what the principal strategy for fighting against fascism is, and that's the establishment of socialism. There's not fascism within socialist countries. There's fascism within capitalist countries that are under threat, in crisis, trying to do anything that they can in order to remain in power. Regarding the uh, movements in Yemen and, and Hezbollah and Hamas and things like that, I'm not a specialist, but I've studied them to try to understand geopolitics. And my sense is that these are anti-imperialist movements that want to get the U.S. and the Western imperialist powers and Israel out so that they can have self-determination, but they are grounded as well in religious movements, right? That are actually quite good at organizing people and getting them dedicated and disciplined and keeping them strategically focused on particular goals. Those goals are not socialist goals, right? Those goals are not the same goals as the PFLP, for instance, in the case of uh, Palestine. And so I think not unlike movements for like national bourgeoisies that would be opposed to imperialism, we can recognize them as tactically, as anti-imperialist, playing a significant role because they are fighting back against the spread of imperialism. But strategically, we should not have any illusions about them somehow then leading to, a, of necessity or by consequence, a kind of spread of socialism. In each of these cases, though, then you'd have to look at how the different organizations relate to, collaborate with, or not, various Marxist organizations. So in the case of Hamas, of course, they do work with the PFLP. And so there, you'd have to descend to a kind of more fine-grained level of analysis to see what's going on in, in that regard. Uh, Ali Qadri has a great book on the unmaking of Arab socialism. And I think part of the larger context is that the pan- Arab socialist movement has historically been incredibly strong and very, very important. And that part of the goal of U.S. imperialism, particularly the kind of new American century model, has been destroying that socialist alternative, even if those forms of socialism are, aren't like full-blown socialism or not absolutely Marxist, they can just be somewhat socialistic in nature, meaning that they provide social welfare for the people, uh, as in the case of Iraq or in the case of Libya or other examples that one could point to. And so I think that from a Marxist vantage point, we really have to be able to be tactically savvy and say, yeah, these anti-imperialists, I think they're doing important work in pushing back, 
Well, strategically, we have to be clear about like, we're not headed in that same direction. We want to get rid of imperialism. But in order to really do that and succeed that in the, in the long term, this can't be a project that's rooted in a kind of religious orientation and a religious state. It has to be oriented towards, towards socialism. I think in order to understand what's currently going on, you need a deeper historical perspective so that the conflict between the imperialist world and the emergent socialist world can be correctly framed. And so I would say very briefly that if you look back 100 years, what was going on in the early 20th century was an inter-imperialist rivalry between the major capitalist countries, and that World War I was a consequence of that, and it had a kind of um, backlash that was precisely the type of backlash that wanted to be avoided by many of the powers in the capitalist world. And that is that it ultimately gave birth to the first successful socialist revolution in what became the Soviet Union in 1917. And that inter-imperialist rivalry, though, continued through what Domenico Lasorda refers to as the 30 years war, because World War I and World War II were largely in continuity and fought between, you know, in the highest at the highest level of abstraction, it was a war fought between the United States and Germany for uh, imperial leadership over the capitalist world. And the Second World War, of course, was primarily fought on the Eastern Front as an attempt on the part of the Nazi war machine to destroy actually existing socialism in the East. And just as World War I had um, failed insofar as it backfired by you know, sparking the emergence of the first uh, socialist republic, World War II backfired in many ways because the Nazi war machine didn't defeat uh, the Red Army. On the contrary, the Red Army defeated the Nazi war machine and proceeded to then liberate Eastern Europe from fascism and from the authoritarian regimes uh, that had preceded fascism in at least most of the Eastern European countries, as well as routing fascism in the East and liberating Korea, um, leading then to a kind of wave of anti-colonial liberation struggles in the wake of World War II, in which the socialist world not only you know expanded right after the war, but then continued to expand in many ways up to about the late 1970s, you know, with uh, the Vietnam War uh, was a situation in which the Vietnamese successfully routed the U.S. imperialist army and established a socialist country in 1975. I mean, it took 20 years to do so, or 30 actually, almost. Um, and so uh, the same with the Korean Peninsula, socialism moves, revolutionary socialism moves to the Western Hemisphere with Cuba in 1959. And so this deeper historical context, I think, is very important because what it allows us to see is that the inter-imperialist rivalry of monopoly capitalism was resolved in two senses. One is that imperialism, as Lenin had predicted, was the staging ground for the emergence of socialism. It prepared the world. It ripened the world for socialism. And that was indeed the case, right? But secondly, it's important to recognize that that inter-imperialist rivalry has been transformed into a leading imperialist power with a series of junior imperialist power, uh, uh, partners. So by the end of World War II, you have the United States emerging as the leader in the imperialist world. And the European powers, the former imperialist powers, had largely been destroyed by the war and therefore were then reintegrated through the Marshall Plan and other mechanisms into a NATO, for that matter, into the Western world, along with Australia, Canada, Japan, etc. And so what you see in the wake of World War II is really a, uh, a war for the former colonies, that is fought between the leading imperialist power and its junior partners on the one hand and the socialists and the emergent socialist world on the other. That tide begins to shift in by the time you get to the late 70s, early 80s with the emergence of neoliberalism as a form of counter-revolutionary revanchism on the part of the imperialist powers. A lot goes into what happened with the kind of phase of neoliberalism, but one key aspect of it was an attempt to dismantle the Soviet Union and the Eastern sphere through a whole series of much more aggressive uh, destabilization campaigns, color revolutions, and things like this. And as well, after the dismantling of the Soviet Union, the rolling back of the social welfare state in the West, which was a class compromise, which was maintained due to the fact that the Soviet Union uh, 
was, and for that matter, Eastern uh, socialism in general, was a reference point for the West insofar as it made them look very bad if they didn't care at a minimal level for their citizens and provide some semblance of, you know, healthcare and housing and education and things like that. And with the Eastern example of the Soviet Union no longer there, neoliberalism could go on the rampage and just completely dissolve that social welfare net, which is a big part of the neoliberal project, as well as the attempt at kind of structural readjustment uh, and the targeting of the third world for ongoing processes of neocolonialism. In that regard, what we're living through, finally to come to the multipolar kind of phase in these developments, is the exhaustion of the neoliberal phase of capitalist accumulation that is due to a number of different factors. One of them is simply 50 years of US-led neoliberal imperialism that has developed a whole series of contradictions, but also demonstrated very clearly to the world what it means to uh, be in a world in which the United States exercises its, its principal leadership. Uh, there's been a massive rolling back of democracy under neoliberalism, uh, both internationally and for that matter, domestically in a country like the United States. There has also been an attempt to um, control the emergence of any countries that want to follow alternative paths to development. And so in that regard, the exhaustion of the neoliberal project has led, and of course, these are processes. They don't start one day and finish the next. Uh, the process of neoliberalization goes back quite deep. And for that matter, the process of developing a multipolar world goes back quite far because the US ultimately was never able to exercise unipolar hegemony. The US became the leading imperialist power in a world in which socialism was expanding. And there's too much, I think, defeatism on the left that doesn't recognize this very fundamental history. Uh, the U.S. was literally on its heels uh, due to the expansion of socialism and its inability to defeat, you know, communist peasants in Vietnam or to completely take over the Korean Peninsula. And in that regard, the U.S. position, although it attempted to exercise unipolar hegemony, never succeeded in doing so fully. The neoliberal phase led it as close as it possibly came to that. But what we're currently living through is the attempt on the part of nations that historically have been subjected to imperialism to put together an alternative development project that pushes back against imperialism. And I think a final thing I'll say on that in that regard, because we might dig into this a little bit deeper, is that it's important to recognize that uh, in the history of liberation struggles from imperialism, it was often necessary for or proved itself to be necessary for socialists to ally with national bourgeoisies that were unsatisfied with imperialism in order to undertake anti-colonial revolutions. It's what some people refer to as the kind of two stages of revolution. You saw this in China, you saw it in Vietnam, and there are other cases thereof, where first the communists allied with the national bourgeoisie in order to expel the imperialist powers that had invaded them. But then the second stage of the revolution was then uh, uh, de, um, well, overthrowing the national bourgeoisie in order to establish socialism. And so the emergent multipolar world isn't, you know, a socialist revolutionary project in the same way that, for instance, the Third International was or the Common Turn in various ways. It is a project of tactical uh, allegiances between national bourgeois developmental projects on the one hand and socialist developmental projects on the other. These are not necessarily strategic partners in the sense of the strategy of the overall kind of objective, but the way in which China as the leading socialist power in the contemporary world is playing things is quite different than the way in which the Soviet Union went to, uh, about these uh, endeavors of you know, struggling in a, against the, the capitalist and imperialist powers. And that is that uh, China clearly is aiming for a process of peaceful development and peaceful cohabitation in which socialism is recognized as being superior for its superior developmental model, right? And I think there's a lot that could be unpacked regarding its Belt and Road Initiative, its role in BRICS and other things, and just what it's been able to demonstrate at its own level of development. But I presume we might return to some of this in the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Uh I think it's important in discussing Lenin's work that we approach uh, both uh, 
his work and the methodology of his work in a kind of dialectical fashion, meaning that Lenin, of course, always insisted on the need for a concrete analysis of concrete situations. There's not some blueprint or some magical recipe that we can find and then we just apply it indiscriminately all over the world. And I have seen within certain figure, you know, certain debates within Western left intelligentsia, an attempt to read, you know, the basic definition of imperialism that Lenin gave, you know, a little bit over 100 years ago, and then just apply it to today. That's not a dialectical analysis. What you need to do is understand what Lenin was doing, understand the way in which he framed that particular historical moment, and draw on the methodological rigor and power of his analysis, not just do a kind of cut and paste job, if you will. And so in the case of Lenin, of course, he defined imperialism most succinctly as the monopoly stage of capitalism, right? When free market capitalism transitions into a form of capitalism in which there's monopoly control on the part of the major corporations that uh, get rid of a lot of aspects of free competition, precisely because they can control everything from the top down, set prices, uh, etc. And in unpacking that definition, you know, Lenin himself said in his book on imperialism, there is no, you know, quick and easy definition of imperialism. And any definition that we give has to be attentive to the, the scale of analysis, right? And you can talk about imperialism very abstractly, or you can zoom in, if you will. And as he zooms in, he highlights five features. The prevalence of monopolies, which I just mentioned, the merging of bank capital with industrial capital, the export of capital on the part of imperialist countries instead of the uh, export of commodities, the formation of international capitalist monopolies, which of course are still very much with us, and the territorial division of the whole world. Meaning that for Lenin, the phase of imperialism was a phase in which the colonial booty had already been divided up amongst the capitalist powers and therefore it was a moment at which they began fighting over access to the colonies which goes a long way to explaining world war one and uh, also world war ii in certain regards if we then have this methodological approach in mind and avoid a simple cut and paste job i think that what we need to do in looking at the history that we have since Lenin himself was writing is that, as I was mentioning a moment ago, this 30 years war of inter-imperialist rivalry leads to a moment in which the United States, due to the fact that it entered both wars late and was also playing a very clear pragmatic game. In fact, Truman, the president of the United States at the time, World War II, is on record as saying, well, if the Russians are uh, winning or the Nazis are winning, that should dictate the way in which we intercede in the war, meaning we could be on the Nazi side, we could be on the Russian side, let's wait and see who's winning, and that will dictate what our precise policy is. And of course, there's a deep history of collusion on the part of the US government and the corporate ruling class with the Nazi uh, regime, and for that matter, with the fascists in Italy. And so the um, the situation in the wake of World War II was one in which the U.S. emerged as the dominant imperial power, and the rivalry between imperialist powers became somewhat secondary to what became the primary contradiction in global politics, and that was the contradiction between and the conflict between socialism on the one hand that hadn't been abolished by the Nazi war machine and capitalism on the other. In that regard, I think it makes sense for us to recognize that in the contemporary world, we're still in a phase of imperialism, but a phase of imperialism that has played out much along the lines of what Lenin himself had already theorized, and that is that it was the staging ground for the emergence of socialism. This struggle between socialism and capitalism has been in fits and starts and has been quite complicated, as I very briefly sketched out, with a kind of neoliberal phase of expansionist uh, imperialism that I mentioned just a moment ago. Now, regarding the kind of specificity of some of this debate on the left, of course, so much of it focuses on Russia and China. We might dig into this a little bit deeper, but I'll just say rather quickly that in the case of Russia, what you had, of course, is a country that emerged from the ashes of actually existing socialism. And to understand contemporary Russia, you have to understand what happened in the demolition of the Soviet Union, which was the most cataclysmic peacetime economic collapse of an industrial country in the history of the world. 
right? This was a collapse that uh, some theorists refer to not as perestroika, but catastroika. It was absolutely catastrophic to the population. I'll just give a few quick examples of this. There was mass pauperization and unemployment, extremes of inequality, rampant crime, uh, combined as well with legalized gangsterism and a precipitous looting of public assets. So by the late 1990s, national income had fallen in, this, uh, in Russia by more than 50%, investment by 80%, and real wages by half. The numbers living below the poverty line in the former Soviet republics had risen from 14 million in 1989 to 147 million before the 1998 financial crash. And so the market experiment had produced more orphans in um, more orphans in Russia than Russia's 20 million plus wartime casualties. You saw epidemics of cholera and typhus, which are basically unknown in the developed industrialized world, reemerge. Millions of children suffered from malnutrition, widespread sex trafficking. Um, the life expectancy plummeted. It was absolutely catastrophic for the population, which explains one of the reasons why in the, at the turn of the 21st century, and there's many different polls that one could look at because these stats are pretty consistent throughout uh, recent history, 85% of Russians regretted the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And of course, in, I believe it was 1991, there was the referendum regarding the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and the overwhelming majority of citizens said that they didn't want the Soviet Union dissolved. In that regard, what we have in contemporary Russia is not the continuation of the Soviet Union. Obviously, it is the consequence of what someone like Michael Parenti calls the third worldization of former socialist countries. They're literally put back at the level of the third world so that all of their um, assets can be looted by the imperialist countries. But there has been a shift in uh, the relatively recent leadership in Russia. And that shift has been away from being the running dog of the imperialist powers who had looted the country and had a, played a very direct role in dismantling the Soviet Union. Uh, the book Victory goes into some of the details of the Central Intelligence Agency's involvement in this destabilization campaign. There's lots of other good documented work on what the US did to uh, contribute to the dismantling of the Soviet Union. But with uh, the Putin regime and the other uh, developments within contemporary Russian politics, it's very clear that there is a process of national restoration an attempt to take Russia out of this phase of just catastrophic destruction on the part of the imperial powers, reestablish some sense of just stability within the country, politically, economically, socially, and also firm up Russia's position within the world. And we see this quite clearly beginning with Syria and continuing up to today when Russia is not willing to follow the Washington line. In that regard, within Russia, Bruno Drevsky and some other people have done excellent work on this front. It's not a capitalist country, but it has a very, very powerful communist movement. And the Communist Party of Russia is, is of course, the second leading political party. And so part of the project of political restoration plays to one audience of the Russian populace, and that is this left-wing progressive audience that has positive memories of or knows positive things about the history of actually existing socialism. But there's another constituency that's also very important within Russia, and that is a constituency that's also invested in national restoration, but a national restoration of a different sort, a more nationalist uh, restoration with even roots going back to czarism and kind of the pre, uh, pre-Soviet Union. And so in that regard, Putin plays to both a kind of uh, a very strong left-wing consti uh, constituency, but also right-wing elements in trying to consolidate a project of national renewal. Um, there's more that could be said about this, but uh, I'll just touch briefly on, on China and we might dig into this uh, more deeply. I think that it's becoming more widely recognized even within the Western a world that China is a socialist country. It's not a capitalist country, but it's a socialist country, as it says itself, with Chinese characteristics. And so it's taken on very specific form since, uh, well, since its inception, but also with the reform and opening up over Deng, uh, under Deng Xiaoping and the 
uh, opening up of China to global capitalism and to uh, foreign investment. And at the same time, the Chinese model of development has been one in which there is an attempt to, uh, I would say, and this is drawing on the work of Cheng and Fu and others who have written quite poignantly on this, to develop socialism as a dialectical process in which you can't leap from the capitalist extant world into a perfect world of communism overnight. It needs to be a dialectical process in which the strategy is always clear and the strategy is a more egalitarian, more ecological sustainable world in which we no longer have wars and mass poverty and all of the horrible things that capitalism brings with it, colonialism, etc. That's the strategy, but the tactics have been such that it's been recognized, not unlike Lenin with the NEP back in the day, allowing capitalist investment. It's that if you want to develop your country and you're in a world in which the capitalist countries not only are the most powerful economically, militarily, but they also have uh, technological advancements that surpass your own, and they have capital and the possibility of capital investment, then socialism needs to be part of a dialectical process in which it tactically works with the capitalist world in various ways, not in order to strategically ally itself with the capitalist world, but in order to be able to leapfrog over the capitalist world in a developmental project that strategically is aiming for the expansion of the socialist world. And so in the case of China, you have seen very great gains on the part of the, uh, you know, what China has done for its own population, uh, perhaps first and foremost, but also its role uh, geostrategically. Because when China, uh, when China became communist in, or socialist in 1949, life expectancy was in its 30s. You know, now it surpasses life expectancy in the United States. The population was largely illiterate at the time, and it had suffered from a century of humiliation. So it had been subjected to uh, various forms of colonialism and neocolonialism and didn't exercise sovereignty. And so in that regard, in relationship to the kind of general debate that's being had on the left over imperialist, anti-imperialist rivalries and things like this, I think that the clear conclusion from a historical materialist analysis is that in the case of Russia, you have a developmental project uh, of the national bourgeoisie that is a project of national rejuvenation that does have some rootedness within the communist movement within Russia. And the Russian Communist Party supports the uh, current uh, the, the military intervention in the Ukraine. And you have uh, China, which is a socialist government that is uh, intent on trying to develop alternative international infrastructure for development. And neither of these countries are invested in an imperialist project as we understand what that means historically. And so in that regard, the emergence of the multipolar world that we were talking about just a moment ago is, you know, uh, the working together of socialist countries with countries that are focused more on national development. And that those projects, I think, can most clearly be understood as anti-imperialist insofar as what they're rejecting is the imperial order in which the United States would lead with its junior partners in tow a world order overseen by, of course, NATO and the military apparatus, all of the economic institutions that it generally controls, IMF, World Bank, et cetera, and all of the, uh, the kind of international organizations uh, like the UN and uh, other such uh, forms of governance. And that world is a world in which the rest of the world has largely been subjected to a status of programmed underdevelopment and or what some theorists call the development of underdevelopment. And that is the world that the Washington consensus is trying to maintain, right? That the countries in the periphery remain in the periphery and are used by the imperialist powers in many, many different ways for economic profit. And what Russia and China are doing with different strategies is saying no to the imperialist world and many, many other countries are saying the exact same thing. 
because they have lived through and experienced at a very visceral level, meaning people are dying from these experiences, the consequences of neoliberal capitalism and U.S. leadership in, in the world today. With the conflict in the Ukraine, this, of course, began in uh, 2014, if not slightly earlier than that, with the U.S.-backed uh, coup d'etat known as the uh, Maidan uprising, in which a government came to power backed by very powerful fascist militias like the Azov Battalion, but then others as well. There's many, many uh, extreme right wing uh, militias within the Ukraine. And so the Ukraine has been a site for U.S. destabilization efforts against Russia going back to, you know, the original Cold War, if you will. And the current intervention on the part of Russia was, you know, there's there's a lot that we could unpack here, but I'll just say very quickly, in the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine, there was a ongoing war on the Russian separatist movement since 2014. So the conflict didn't begin with the Russian special, special military operation. It began in 2014. And if my memory serves me right, I think there's some 14,000 people uh, who have been killed by the Ukrainians during that time. While the Ukrainian government has gone full on totalitarian, meaning that they have banned opposition parties, locked up communists, they've taken control of the press, they have a draconian control that they're exercising over uh, the country. And they've been used in many ways, some of them complicit, like obviously Zelensky and uh, many of the Ukrainian oligarchs who work with him and support him, uh, they uh, have been used, though, nonetheless, by the United States in its proxy war against Russia. But of course, in this proxy war, the ultimate goal is China, because what China represents is the greatest threat to the imperialist powers, because it's not simply a project of national development within a capitalist framework. It's a socialist country that has demonstrated a form of socialist development internally and internationally that is the most threatening thing to the imperialists because it demonstrates that you can, if you have control of the state and of the pillars of the economy, as China does, as the, the Communist Party of China does, then you can oversee forms of development that are not simply founded on the maximization of profit at all costs. And we've seen the successful consequences of that. One of the clearest examples of is the elimination of extreme poverty within China. 850 million people were elevated out of extreme poverty in a long uh, anti-poverty campaign that was waged by the Communist Party of China. In that uh, campaign, just to contextualize that, that means that more than the entire population of Latin America, which is around 720 million people, were elevated out of extreme poverty. That fact alone, I think, but there's many, many others, puts the lie to the idea that China is somehow not Marxist or not socialist. Why would a country spend so much of its time and resources helping the helpless at such an incredible scale? It's the largest poverty alleviation program in the history of humanity. Why would they do that if they were just, you know, another capitalist power, another imperialist power, or the other things that you hear. And it's also, you know, it's really unfortunate because it really traffics in a very base form of racism that tends to be very acceptable within the Western world. And that is racism against Asians and Chinese in particular. There are, you know, almost 100 million members of the Chinese Communist Party and all of the leadership who say that what they're doing is, is socialism. And it's quite... Uh, how to put it, lacking in humility on the part of certain leftist intellectuals or activists who know little to nothing about China, usually haven't been there, usually don't speak the language, to simply say from the outside, oh, no, it's just capitalist because there's a billionaire class or not even, you know, it's kind of a class stratum that they're actually cracking down on in various ways, or that there is capitalism or that it uh, uses money or, you know, other things like this, which are basically kind of ultra leftist misunderstandings of what socialism is. Socialism isn't communism in some pure state. Socialism is the difficult dialectical project 
of developing a process of human liberation that is more egalitarian out of the confines of a very violent and destructive system, which is global capitalism. Um, there's more that I could say definitely about uh, China in that regard, but concerning Russia, there are some right wing elements within Russia, particularly within the kind of military industrial complex and the, uh, the kind of orthodox uh, networks. Uh, does that mean that Russia itself is just this extreme right wing force? I think that that is a very naive way of reading Russia and that you also have to do a level of dialectical analysis that looks at some of the details. So what I was alluding to earlier is the primary polarization within Russia is two different models of national rejuvenation. One is not simply returning to the Soviet Union or communism, but it's drawing on the resources of the history of the Soviet Union in order to look towards a socialist future. And the other is a more right-wing constitu constituency. But within the geopolitical sphere, if you look at what Russia's doing, even at the national level, if there is this kind of contradiction, if you will, and there are right-wing and left-wing forces, internationally, the role that Russia is currently playing is it is the kind of one of the leading forces in struggling very directly against US-led imperialism. So on the world stage, Russia is playing partly a progressive role. Doesn't mean that I justify the special military operation, I support everything about what Putin does and says and all of this, right? But I think that world historically, the fact that Russia is saying no to the agenda that is pushed by the imperialist powers is extremely important. And it's one of the reasons that they work and have worked so closely as of late with China and often operate in such a way that their own endeavors are ones that also coalesce with the Chinese orientation, with the exception, actually, of the intervention in the Ukraine, because the Chinese have always maintained that they want to respect national sovereignty and therefore have not um, uh, have not taken a kind of uh, explicitly supportive role in that regard concerning the, the military campaign. I guess maybe the last thing that I would say, uh, returning to the kind of larger stakes of your question, is that given what I said earlier about how World War I and World War II were largely kind of ongoing inter-imperialist rivalry that led to this backlash of an expanding socialist world, what we're seeing now is that the era of neoliberal triumphalism is behind us. Socialism didn't disappear. Democracy didn't reign supreme. Wars didn't disappear. The ecological catastrophe didn't magically evaporate. Like the world is actually much worse than it was due to decades and decades of neoliberal imperialism. And the current world though, does have an emergent alternative model of development. The strongest and most visible one in that regard is the socialist model of development within China. But of course, there are socialist you know, projects elsewhere, Cuba and Vietnam and Laos and Korea and, and other such places, uh, Venezuela, as well as very strong socialist movements or at least left-leaning and progressive governments in, in various ways. And so the left hasn't disappeared, socialism hasn't disappeared, and on the contrary, what has been demonstrated by uh, China is a form of development. Let's see if I have um, some of the statistics here because they're quite uh, impressive. Um, because part of the developmental model in China has been to demonstrate the superiority of socialist development over, uh, over capitalist development. And I wasn't able to find the stats right here, but if you look at the the recent history of, oh no, here's some of them are, right? So um, John Ross has aggregated data from the World Bank. Couldn't be accused of being a pro-communist organization, right? It's the largest data set that we currently have. And he argues based on these data sets that quote, China's rate of increase of life expectancy in the three decades after 1949 was the fastest ever recorded in a major country in human history. And he marshals the same type of evidence to demonstrate that in seven decades, China's economy will have gone from being only one sixth of the size of the US economy to overtaking it. 
The war on China is a war on the socialist developmental project that demonstrates to the world that we don't have to go down the capitalist path. That has to be stopped. That being said, I think that the US administration and the corporatocracy, given the ways in which they're always interested in short-term gain, they're always focused on profit at all costs, they were not prepared and I think made enormous mistakes regarding the way in which the Chinese socialist project has played the long game. And in playing the long game, in many ways, I think they've outplayed what has gone on in the West because the productive base of the economy was outsourced and moved abroad through the new neoliberal phase, gutted from the United States. So it would produce, you know, basically weapons of mass destruction is one of the primary things that we produce, as well as a uh, systematic industrialized forms of ignorance through the culture industries. But other than that, most of the productive sector of the economy has been offshored and China has developed an incredibly powerfully, uh, powerful and productive economy. The US economy has been largely financialized. And so the neoliberal bet really has led to very dire consequences. And I think that a lot of the US administration and the capitalist ruling class see the writing on the wall. And that is that in the long game, we are losing out against an alternative developmental project that not only continues to advance, but in spite of all of the things that we try to do to destabilize it and overthrow it and to slander it, et cetera, it continues to make very, very significant progress. And so that's what the new Cold War is, is it's the old Cold War. It is the world historical struggle between two socioeconomic systems. One is capitalism that feeds off of imperialism and colonial relationships, and the other is a form of development in which the value produced by human beings is redistributed to those human beings in the form of healthcare and education and housing and the development of full cultural beings, right? And so that requires uh, on the part of the, the US and the Western powers an attempt both ideologically, and now we're seeing, of course, and we have seen this for a while, militarily and through mechanisms like the US national security state, an attempt to get rid of the socialist alternative by any means necessary. And this is going to be, I think, the defining aspects of the world that we're living in in the coming decades. The rise of fascism, particularly within the imperialist core, the prominence of China, and hence the risks of World War III against China, which is a peaceable country that wants peaceable relationships with all of its neighbors. And thirdly, the major third major catastrophe that we're all facing is ecological collapse. And China has undertaken what they refer to as the development of an environmental civilization in which they are now the global leaders at so many different levels in, in uh, renewable energies and in a kind of transformation of the developmental model such that it becomes much more uh, sustainable, which is perfectly in line with uh, socialist, socialist principles. Certain people on the left either claim that BRICS or BRICS plus changes everything and it's a watershed moment and we're in a new era. And I've heard others on the left also say things like this makes no difference. It actually doesn't really have any oomph, doesn't have any power to it. The bank isn't actually fully functioning in the way that it could at higher levels. And my uh, analysis of what's going on with BRICS is largely based on a dialectical approach. BRICS is a process that has attempted to develop a very different modality of international uh, development than the dominant imperialist model, right? Is there more uh, room for work and improvement on this front? Yes, absolutely. Is it completely insignificant? No, not at all. Uh, it is part of an ongoing process by which Countries that have been historically underdeveloped by imperialism are attempting to develop global infrastructure for an alternative developmental model. And so BRICS also we have to think of along with the Belt and Road Initiative that has some 150 countries, more than that now, that are involved in it uh, with Shanghai Cooperation Agreement. Like there's a lot of different forms of international infrastructure that are being developed.
in relationship to what I was saying earlier about the kind of two-stage theory of revolution in anti-colonial struggles, that first the socialists ally with the bourgeoisie in order to expel the imperialists, and then they consolidate their forces and expel the capitalists in order to establish socialism. I think one has to ask in relationship to BRICS whether or not something somewhat similar is going on. And that is that it's a developmental project in which clearly socialists are working with projects of bourgeois national development that are anti-imperialist in the sense of the dominant form of imperialism that is the U.S.-led imperialism. And that this phase of the struggle is incredibly important for being able to break the chains or at least loosen the chains of global imperialism. So I think it's important to support BRICS in these other endeavors insofar as they're providing a model that's different than IMF, World Bank, and the kind of uh, neoliberal uh, model that was so prevalent. I think it's also um, it's also important that the BRICS is developing a kind of multipolar infrastructure that is bringing together at least three kind of different elements. One is financial reform. So there's access to capitalist development with BRICS Bank, et cetera. And, uh, I'm sorry, there's access to um, uh, capital for development projects and also the whole process of de-dollarization, which is so significant within uh, what is currently going on in the kind of emergent multipolar world. But there's also a clear development agenda, right, that a lot of what's going on within BRICS and these other developmental projects is, well, how can we build up global infrastructure, global technological exchanges, uh, global networks of connectivity? so that countries across the global south can work together and collaborate on autonomous developmental projects that aren't mediated by the imperialist core and hence within which they would play a subordinate role. And the third very important element, I think, is just multipolar regionalism, right? Breaking down the idea that there would be just kind of one dominant center. And China, in spite of the fact that, of course, it's one of the leading forces within BRICS, is very clear that they do not want to simply be the leader in a kind of new third international like uh, the Soviet Union was during the era of the third international. They want to collaborate with other countries and have peaceable modalities of development, which is quite interesting because one of the things that the Chinese, I think, have, well, I know, have done very studiously is examine the history of the Soviet Union, what worked and what didn't work, and the relationship that the Soviet Union took to other socialist countries within certain of its international framework tended to be, or at least was accused of being on the part of the Chinese, uh, one in which there was a kind of national chauvinism, right? Like the Soviets are going to lead the world and all the others are supposed to follow in tow. Chinese have learned that lesson and been very, very clear. That's not the relationship that they want to maintain. They want a collaborative relationship in which everybody benefits. There's mutual beneficial development, if you will. And so uh, that's an important aspect, I think, as well of BRICS. And maybe one of the last things that I would say is just the significance of, of BRICS Plus and the most recent expansion of BRICS Plus, because what this demonstrates as well is a, uh, a kind of energy powerhouse that BRICS Plus now is uh, with, you know, Russia, China, India, um, there's uh, Saudi Arabia with UAE, there is now uh, a level of control over global energy that is very different than the era of the US driven kind of petrodollar and the close proximity between Saudi Arabia and the United States. And the uh, way in which uh, BRICS Plus is, is developing makes it such that it is now a global powerhouse, right? So some of the stats are that uh, BRICS Plus controls 39% of global oil exports, 45.9% of proven reserves, and 47.6% of all oil produced globally, right? This is an enormous, enormous shift in relationship to access to one of the most important sources of uh, energy in the world as it currently exists. Obviously, there's an attempt to phase uh, out fossil fuel, uh, their dependence on fossil fuel production. Uh, but you have to do this in a dialectical fashion if you want to actually develop your society. And so China and the other countries involved 
with BRICS obviously uh, understand that. There's more that could be said about this, but maybe I'll just leave it at that for now. Thank you very much. And, and I also think that the, uh, you know, with, the, with their consolidating um, energy, that it also will lead to the, the rise of de-dollarization yeah. um, and an alternative currency, which is also a positive development. And, and, and already there are countries that are trading in their own currencies, right? Mm -hmm. Which is significantly changing the dynamic. And so the uh, hegemonic role that the dollar has played on international markets is obviously it's not completely changed. You know, this is a process that is gradual, but there have been very significant shifts as of late, which is an exciting development for breaking the chains of uh, uh, imperial dominion at the level of the uh, financial uh, processes in financial markets. Right. Right. Yeah. Sanctions have, have are essentially a form of war. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, well, those are all the questions uh, we have for you for today. Is there anything else you want to discuss or add before we close? I guess I would just say, given the types of things that we've discussed, that I do think it's really important that people within the Western world who are part of progressive networks uh, take very seriously the need to critically reflect on the limits of their own, uh, how, to, how to put it, to critically reflect on the ways in which the history of imperialism has produced conditions by which the Western left actually tends to have a lot of difficulty seeing and understanding what's going on globally. And the two principal reasons for that are the labor aristocracy, the fact that in the imperial core, workers have across different strata historically benefited from colonialism. And that means that it's in their financial interest to perpetuate colonialism and support imperialism. And there's a lot of people within the Western world, including progressives, who will support imperialism based on this kind of base drive uh, economically. But the other thing that has been so integral to the formatting of the Western left has been the awesome control exercised by the culture industries. And the fact that 90% of what all U.S. Americans see and hear is produced by five mega corporations. And so there's an industrialized form of ignorance that is incredibly powerful. And what you see then is if it be at the level of the economic base or at the level of the ideological superstructure, the Western left has a lot that it needs to struggle against. And so the work that you're doing, other kind of journalists, activists and intellectuals are doing in order to open up the ideological confines of the Western left so that we can basically identify what I take to be at least the single most important orientation, and that is anti-imperialism first and foremost, but then secondarily and in conjunction with that, the support for an alternative socioeconomic model that is aimed at avoiding the three fundamental uh, kind of crises, the deepest crises, at least that I see operative, other than the crisis of capitalism that undergirds all of them and is the crisis that just keeps on giving. And that is the crisis of uh, the possibility of nuclear apocalypse, the crisis of uh, fascism and rising fascism across the capitalist core in particular, but also more uh, generally around the world. And then uh, also just the ecological degradation. And so we need to be serious about the necessity of supporting the struggle against imperialism and the struggle to build a more egalitarian world if we want to avoid the cataclysmic writing on the wall, so to speak.